Oh, let me pull up the question. Okay, it says, uh, so two numbers A and B are chosen at random from 0 to 75. And you have a line OD, I think it was called, which was length 200. And then, so you had two triangles that formed that were right with the first one having an angle of A and then the second one having an angle of B. Is that right? And O or B, yeah. So, and you want the probability that these two points are within 100 of each other. So you want this point and this point to be within 100 of each other. This is also a right angle. So how I approach this is by first noting that since it's a right angle, it must be a hemisphere. So these two would be on a circle with center at the midpoint of OD. So something like that. So this circle has radius 100. So if the two points are within 100 of each other, then that means that that means that uh, this angle must be 60 or less. So how could we find this? Well, uh, if you, let me try a different color. If we see this angle right here, we notice that it's an inscribed angle, which means that it has half the measure of 60 or 30. So this also could be found as a minus b or b minus a. So just the absolute value of a minus b has to be less than or equal to 30. So now we can, we have like a condition. Um, this also could be read as a and b at, are at most 30 apart. And we can draw a geometric probability thingy. Now where's the square tool? Yeah, here we go. So if this is 0 and this is 75 and this is 8 and then this is 75 for B, then the area, the total area is 1 because this is all possible values that we can draw. And if A and B are no greater than 30 apart, then it looks something like this. Oh gosh, I should use the straight line. And then this part is shaded in with this side being 30. Same over here. And then, so we just want the probability, which is the area of this relative to the total area. So this side would be 45. So the red area would be 75 squared minus 45 squared by counting the white spaces and then dividing by 75. And then this becomes, let's see, 5 squared minus 3 squared over 5 squared. And that would be 16 over 25. So I believe the answer is 41. Yeah, and the answer is indeed 41. So does anybody have any questions or comments? No. And does anybody have another way of solving this problem? Why is a minus b equal to 30? Okay, um, let me clear everything. Is there a circle tool? Oh, there is. That's nice. 
So if you have a circle and the center is here and you have an arc like AB, then if you draw a point on the circle to A and then to B, it would be one half of the length of arc AB. So let's call this point P. So written out in equation, this would be APB is equal to one half the measure of arc AB. So since AB here was going to be 60, then half of 60 would be 30, and so that angle would have been 30. All right, uh, so are there any other questions or comments? No, okay. Well, is there anybody who knows another way of solving this problem? All right, so I have a method for solving this problem, which is probably a lot slower and a lot easier for like room, like it's more, like there's uh, more room for error in this solution, but it's still another type of solution. So let me just get it. Oh, Okay, uh, so for my solution, uh, we know like we uh, obviously have the OP, uh, you know, it's key. yeah, we have OP, and then we have right, and then we need to find the distance between R and Q. So we have R here, and we have Q here, let's just say, and we have to find the distance between them. So what I did was that I used uh, some trigonometry to figure this out, but it is kind of like a long solution. So yeah. All right, so how are we going to figure out the distance between R and Q? So let's say we set uh, O as the origin because it doesn't matter where OP is inside of the plane. So we could just say like O is the origin. So it would be zero, zero. And then P, because uh, let's say P is on the X axis. And since it has to be 200, a distance of 200 from O, it would be 200, oh, uh, 200, zero. Okay, and then if we can find the uh, coordinates of R and Q, then we can figure out the distance between them by looking at the difference of their uh, X and Y values and squaring them and you know doing Pythagoras. Okay, so what do we do after this? So let's draw out our right angles. So we have a right angle here and we have a right angle here. Okay, and then we also have a few angles over here. So let's just say this angle is A and this angle is B. Okay, now what can we do? So what we can do is that we, uh, we can find, because we're given what OP is, right? And we're also given the angles here of uh, R, OP, and Q, OP. So this OP is 200. And then, uh, and then we can see that this means we can figure out the distance of OR and OQ. So to figure out the di distance of OR and OQ, we have to, uh, so let me type this out. So OR is equal to uh, cosine B times OP, which is 200. Because as you can see, we have the angle B, right? 
cosine b is equal to the OR side divided by the OP side. And if we multiply by OP, it would be equal to OR. And we also have OQ is equal to cosine a times OP. Okay, and what do we do after this? So let's draw a few more lines. I'm just going to change the color. We can draw an altitude. And we can figure out the altitudes and also the x values of the coordinates of r and q uh, because we can use the angles again to do some trigonometry. So we know what the values of OR and OQ are. And then we can get that. Wait, I need to label a few points. Yeah, okay, so first off, let's say that this point here that's closer to uh, O is labeled as T. So this point is point T. And then this point is point S. Okay, so we have point T and point S and these are right angles here. So then we can figure out the X and Y coordinates. Okay, and then after that we have RT, which is basically the x coordinate of no, uh, no, the y coordinate of uh, the, of R is going to be equal to this uh, sine b times OR. And then we have QS is equal to sine a times uh, OQ. And then if we like plug in all the values, then we get that RT is equal to uh, sine B times cosine B times 200. And then we have uh, QS is equal to sine A times OQ. So it's sine A times cosine A times 200. Okay, so we have these equations down. And then we have to figure out the x coordinates. So that is, we have to figure out OT and we also have to figure out OS. So OT is, uh, OT is just cosine B times OR and this is equal to uh, cosine squared B times 200. And then OS is equal to uh, cosine A times uh, OQ is equal to cosine squared A times 200. Okay, and now what do we do with these values? Because we're looking for the distance between R and Q. So we, we have to find the Oh, we have to find the distance between them, which means that we need the x distance and also the y distance. Okay, so first off, the x distance is equal to the absolute value of RT minus QS. And then this is equal to the absolute values of two, 200 times in, in parentheses, sine b cos actually should I okay no sine b times cosine b and then minus sine a times cosine a and then we oh, know that's not the x value that's that's the y value my bad and then the x value would be uh, os minus ot the absolute value of os minus ot and this is equal to uh 200 times in brackets cosine squared b minus cosine squared a. Okay, so now we have the x and y values. And then to find the distance, we need to figure out uh, x to the power of two plus y to the power of two, and then to the power of one half or like square rooted. Okay, so if we, uh, if we square x and we square y, then we can get rid of the absolute value symbols. So I'll just put this up here. And I'll start some new text.
Okay, so okay, so we can see from the sine b times cosine b minus. Uh, okay, wait. Actually, we should first list out our equation first. So we have two hundred. Two hundred. Yeah, two uh, two hundred times sine. Sine b times cosine b minus sine a times cosine a. Let me just make this longer. Yeah, okay, we can do it like this. Okay, so we have 200 times this, and then this entire thing needs to be squared plus in brackets, uh, 200 times cosine squared b minus cosine squared a. And then this has to be, oh yeah, this has to be squared as well. And it has to be less than or equal to a uh, hundred squared. Okay, and then we we see that there's like a hundred squared and there's two hundred squared on each side. So we can just divide by ten thousand on each side, and we get that this side is one and this side is two, and it's two right here as well. Okay, and then we look at this right, and this looks like uh, the double angle formula. So we have uh, two times sine b times cosine b minus sine a times cos uh, times cosine a. So like, so uh, so first off, uh, let me write down the double angle formulas. So let's say we have a sine of two x, and the sine of two x is going to be equal to two times sine x cosine x, and then we also have cosine two x. And this is equal to cosine squared x minus sine squared x. No, I mean, uh, yeah, sine squared x. And then, but this is also equal to, because we know that cosine squared plus uh, cosine squared of anything and sine squared of anything added together is equal to one. So we can have two cosine to the power of two x minus one. And we see here, right, there's a sine b times a cosine b. So like it looks like the double angle formula for sine. So we can simplify this equation into because we have, right, like 2 times sine b times cosine b is just uh, sine 2b. And then we minus sine 2a because it's just similar to how the sine b times cosine b is. And then this has to be squared. And then after that, we have to add we see that there's a, a cosine squared b. So cosine squared b looks like, like if we multiply two, we would have two cosine squared b minus two cosine squared a. And so, uh, so two cosine squared b is equal to cosine two x plus one. But then we would have to minus, uh, no, okay, so let, let's write it down first. So the first part would be cosine two b plus one, but then we have to minus a sine two B plus one. So the ones cancel out. So we don't have to worry about the ones anymore. And we're just left with uh, cosine two B minus, oh wait, no, that's not, that's not right. Cosine two A. So then we have cosine two B minus cosine two A right here squared. And then this result will have to be uh, less than or equal to one. Okay, so we simplified it quite a bit, and now let's open the brackets and let's uh, let's see what we get. So we get sine to the power of two two b plus sine to the power of two two a minus two times sine two b sine two a, and then we add the cosine to the power of two, two b, cos uh, and yeah, cosine to the power of two, two a, and then we subtract by two times cosine two b cosine two a, and it's small, uh, less than or equal to one. 
okay, so now we've got this result, right? And it looks like well, there's a lot of complicated stuff, but we know that for any x, sine, uh, sine x squared plus cosine x squared is equal to one. So we can just basically cancel this term and this term to equal to one, this term and this term to equal to one. So we have two minus two uh, sine two b sine two a minus two cosine two b cosine two two a. And this is less than or equal to one. Okay, so now, uh, okay, so now we have this, right? And let's just move everything uh, with like the two Bs and two As on one side and the numbers on the other side. And we get that sine two B sine two A uh, plus uh, cosine two B cosine two A is going to be larger or equal to one because two minus one. Okay, and uh, right here we can see that this is, if we, for example, if we have a sine A plus B, right? What is sine A plus B? Sine A plus B is equal to, uh, uh, is equal to sine A times, wait, no, wait, no, it's not sine. Okay, yeah, it's, no, it's the law of cosines. So cosine A plus B is equal to, uh, cosine a yes cosine two a yeah wait wait one second wait I think I, I think I did something wrong here but like I somehow still got the right answer uh, wait let me check this Okay, no, I didn't get this wrong. Okay, so it's cosine A times cosine B minus sine A times sine B. Okay, and now we can see that if we, instead of just an A and a B, if we put two A and two B inside of here, right, and then we get two A plus, no, 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 this is minus, my bad, two A minus two B, right, and then this is, yeah, this should be plus here if it's minus. So then we get that cosine 2a minus 2b is equal to cosine 2a cosine 2b plus sine 2a sine 2b. So then we can just simplify this equation into cosine 2a minus 2b is going to be, uh, oh yeah, this is one over two because we got, no, wait, no, this isn't, no, this is one over two because we got rid of the two is going to be larger or equal to one half. Okay, and then continuing on, then we have, uh, so, so what values of cosine is larger or equal to one over half? So the values would be like uh, from uh, my negative 60 degrees to 60 degrees. So then we would have 2a minus 2b is going to be larger or equal to mi minus 60 degrees and smaller or equal to positive 60 degrees. And note that if we add 360 degrees to any value of degrees, then it will basically be the same amount of degrees. But since uh, inside of the problem, we have that uh, A minus B has to be, uh, the, it's bounded by negative 75 and positive 75 inside the problem. So we can't have anything like 60 plus, 360 degrees or negative 60 plus 360 degrees. Okay, and if we simplify this even further, we get that A minus B is larger or equal to negative 30 degrees or is smaller or equal to 30 degrees. So in the end here, we basically get the same result as Daniel did, and we can just figure out the probability by using a uh, geometric probability. So yeah, so in the end, in Daniel's result, it was also negative 30 to 30 and inside of negative 75 to 75, except that this is just, I guess, a less efficient way of doing the problem and more prone to mistakes. It's a longer process. Okay, so that's 
uh, that's like the other solution to this problem. So does anybody have any questions or comments? No, okay. All right, uh, let's move on to question number two now. So for question number two, does anybody want to uh, explain question number two? I can, um, but I did like coordinate geometry, so is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. For question number two? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the solutions. All right, nice. Um, all right. Board. Okay, so firstly, just draw a rectangle and I just drew it like, let's see, let's see. Let's sort of so I just said this was A, this was B, this was C, and this was D. And I said D is zero comma zero. So this would be zero comma 42. And this would be 84 comma 42. And then C is 84 comma zero. And what's next? Um, M is the midpoint of AD. So M would be somewhere around here, zero comma 21. Um, next point is N, which is a trisection of AB closer to A. So that's just um, 28 comma 42. This is N. So CM and DN connect to form O. Oh, uh, we can just use like, we can just find the line of DN, which is um, Y equal, or for DN, Y equals three over two X. And for CM, the line should be Y is negative a fourth of an X plus 21. We can just find the intersection of this. So O should be 12 comma 18. All right. And then there exists a point P that lies a bacon, um, BCON. Um, so it'll look something like this, I assumed, which is not a very good of me, but yeah, I think we can just, there's a pretty simple way to like show it. Um, BP bisects the area of BCON. That means is BPC will always be a triangle. Uh, I mean, first week, what we can do is uh, we find the, the area of BCON and we can use that using the shoelace formula. Um, if you don't know it, it's just, uh, you just write it as a matrix, so. If we start at B, we, or if we, let's start at C because there's a zero, 84, zero. B is 84, 42. Uh, N is 28, 42. And then O is 12, 18. And then we connect the whole shape but going back to 84 is comma zero. And we can say, all right, 84 times 42, we write that down. 84 times 42. 84 plus 42 times 42, so it's another one of those. And then 28 times 18. And then 12 times zero, so I'll just do nothing. And then there's the opposite direction, so there's zero times 84. This should be a negative, by the way, you minus all the next portion where it's like the opposite direction. 24, 28 times 42. Plus 12 times 42 plus 18 times 84. And then you divide this, you take the absolute value of this and divide it by two. And you get, I'm just gonna erase all this. 
You should get some. What did I get? 1092, I believe. Wait. I don't know my work anymore. <laughs> I think it's 1092. It's either 1092 or 2184. Just, I don't remember if I divided the two already or not. So let's keep them both here. We know that this length is BC is 42. And BPC should be, is a triangle that is, if it lies on OC, it should cover half the area. Um, otherwise, if it's like this, then it'd be like this. Um, you can show that it doesn't work for this one because it's too small of an area. Uh, I didn't do that. I just kind of eyeballed it. Um, anyway, so BPC, we know that it should come out to like, I think 546, 546 area. If we do this times 42. And then, so this divided by 42, that's going to be the height of this, which we can subtract from P to get the, to get Wait. the X coordinate, yeah? Uh, the area of uh, O and B, C is 2184. Oh, it is 2184? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's 2184. All right, I, I can't read my work. Um, all right, so it's 2184. So that means BPC should have an area of 1092. Um, so we divide this by 42, we get the height, which is two, is it 226? I think it's 26. Um, but more importantly, we just subtract that from 84 because we're trying to find the X coordinate and D is like down there. Wait one second. Uh, uh, you forgot to like, you know, area of a triangle, you have to divide two. So you have to multiply a two back onto the 26. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am missing a lot of stuff. 52 yeah. here. Um, 84 minus this. Oh, yeah, this makes this is where it's all in back. All right, so the x coordinate is going to be 32. And since it's on this line, it's negative 1 fourth x plus 21. This gives you 13. And then you're just left with 13 times. Uh, let me clear up some things. Wait, I don't think it should be 52. It should be 26 because it, uh, wait a minute. No, yeah, yeah, because this whole area has like 1,092. Oh, wait, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I looked at it wrong. All good, okay. all good. <laughs> um, so this is, this has a height of 13 because the Y value is 13. And so if we draw the other line back to D somewhere there, um, it's be 13 times 84 divided by 2, which is 546. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so that's my solution. It's very messy. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Uh, yeah, and the answer is indeed 546. And you don't have to use coordinates for this. Uh, although coordinates does make this easy, you can also find like the position of O pretty easily using geometry. So all you have to do is you have to draw an altitude from O to AD and then using similar triangles because let's say the altitude is like a uh, point, let's say it's point H, right? So we can have O, a uh, triangle OMH is similar to triangle CMD and triangle uh, OHD is similar to triangle uh, NAD. So that way, if you set like, uh, for example, let's say the distance from O to H was uh, H and the distance from M to H was X, then you can pretty easily figure out the, uh, like, uh, the position of O. So yeah, uh, both ways work. And does anybody have any questions or comments? All right, well, thank you for presenting your solution and let's move on to question three. So morning.
Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, let's just continue on to question number three. So, okay, so yeah, let's continue on to question number three. So, does anybody want to explain question number three? I can explain this one, but I did it again using corner geometry. Oh. Sure, I mean, you can explain it. All right. I mean, does anyone else want to explain? Wait, wait. How do I clear this? Okay, so there's like a circle with radius one. Oh boy, this triangle diagram is gonna be a bit interesting. And there's like gonna be another circle. And then another circle. Then another circle. I think that's good enough for now. Okay, so this big circle is, is circle C0. And I said, um, well, it has, a, I just set the center of C0 to be 0, 0. I cannot, this diagram. So this is like 0, 0. And so this would be E0. We know that it has 1, 0, because the radius of circle 0 has 1. And yeah, that's why we know it. And so, if we look at this um this next circle in line C1, we can did we can see that since it's like the center is on the same line because uh I don't know the mathematical reason, but it looks like it's on the same line. We can say, okay, so if it has a radius, it shares this point. So we can say this is radius r and this is like one minus r. So the center of circle C1 should be one minus R comma zero. Okay. And then next in line should be this. Uh, oh, you skipped a circle. Oh, did I skip a circle? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This circle. And then that's somewhere like around here. But again, it's, since it shares like 90, this is supposed to be 90 degrees. It's supposed to be on the same line. And since it has R squared, we know it has, my diagram is very sad, but that's okay. So it should be R minus R squared because this is R squared and this is R. So the next center should be one minus R comma, r minus r squared. So the reason I'm doing this is because eventually this will become infinitely small, I believe. And so once it becomes infinitely small, I can deduce that that's where point B is because if it's infinitely small, it's going to be a point and that's going to be point B. And then the next one should be this circle. Uh, once we find a pattern, we can obviously do like a geometric thing. Geometric, geometric series. Some of geometric series, that's what I'm trying to say. So this circle, it shares a, it's gonna be to the left of this. So it should be one minus R, minus R squared because you go back in R squared and then, or R squared, hold up, hold up. One minus R. R cubed, right? No. No, you're like, so uh, for the horizontal way, uh, so first off, if you would start from the origin, you would have to go one minus R. And then after that, like you go up and then you go the other direction. So you will have to subtract by R squared minus R to the power of three. R squared minus R to the power of three. Yeah. 
but it would be subtract because it's the other direction. Oh, you're right. You're right. Because it's like this is like r squared. This whole thing is r squared, but then minus r cubed. Yeah. All right. And then we minus that so it would be plus r cubed. Okay. And then this is still r minus r squared. And then I'm not going to draw the next circle because I, I mean, since we have this logic, I think we can just deduce what the next one's going to be. So we need to go downwards. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to be r cubed because that's bigger than minus r to the fourth. And so if we go downwards, it's going to be minus this. So the next circle or the next center will be one minus r minus r squared plus r cubed comma r minus r squared minus r cubed plus r to the fourth. So at this point, I, th I think there's like the pattern. I mean, if you go further, you can say, okay, the next one for this, it's obviously gonna go right. It's gonna be plus r to the fourth minus r to the fifth. And at that point we see, okay, um, there's a pattern. It'll be a plus minus minus plus plus minus minus for the geometric sequence. So, if we think about it as, all right, what if like the first term is A equals one minus R, and then there's a common ratio of R, which is kind of nice to think about. So this first one will be one minus R over, oh, negative R, oops. The common ratio is negative R. Wait, I have a suggestion. Uh, yeah. Like, I see what you're doing. You're like, I think you're uh, like, first off calculating the values of like one minus r and then uh r to the four minus r to the fifth and such right yeah okay yeah. uh and like uh, this uh this is just to speed things up a bit but you can just multiply by one minus r to the fourth uh r to the r to the power of four on both sides and then like you can just get the answer wait what because it's uh, it's like uh so you have a uh, one minus r minus r to the squared plus r to the power of three and then yeah. you have plus r to the fourth minus r to the uh power of five minus r to the power of six plus r to the power of seven and it's just like repeating every r to the power of four. Yeah, I just said it's like this is like these have like common. It should be negative r squared on the bottom. Uh, I mean, I can do r to the fourth, but there's like it, the pop part will factor, I think, still. Um, let me try it. Let me try it. So it should be positive r to the fourth and minus r squared plus r cubed, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to erase all this. So we have a equals, this, this is for the x coordinate, one minus r minus r squared plus r cubed, and then one minus r to the fourth. Mm -hmm. So we can factor out a one minus r, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and a I'll one just minus r. And uh, r plus one for both of them. Wait, can we factor out like two one minus r's then? Okay, uh, I'll just let you, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one minus r to the fourth, we know factors into one minus r squared times one plus r squared, which factors into one minus r times one plus r times one plus r squared. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, yeah. This cancels out and we're just left with that. That's actually sad. Oh, and we can factor out the one plus r. Oh, this is so sad. Anyways, this is one minus r over one plus r squared. And if you remember the next one is just the y coordinate. It's just that it, this times r to everything. So it's just r minus r squared over one plus r squared. And so the last step is to just use a uh, distance formula. So one minus r squared plus r minus r squared over one plus r squared squared. And take the square root of this. This top part, we can factor out a one minus r squared and we're left with the one plus r squared. So we get one minus r squared times one plus r squared, which cancels out with the one plus r squared. 
So we get one minus R over square root of one plus R squared. Okay, clear it again, cause I'm not good at using a whiteboard. One minus R over square root of one plus R squared. We, we can look at the bottom first. So we plug in 11 over 60, uh, it gives us 121 over 60 plus one or 3600, 3600. Obviously it'll come out to 61 over 60 because this is like two times 60 plus one. And so that's like perfect square because this is 60 squared. So that'll be 61 over 60. The top part is one minus 11 over 60, 49 over 60. And this should be 49 over 61. And uh, 110. Oh, that was an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, yeah. Exactly. And okay. so, does anybody have any questions or comments? All right. Uh, then let's move on to question number four. And Ooh. thank you, Harry, for presenting your solution to two questions. And. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, Charles, if you would like to present question number four. Um, okay. <clears throat> for question four, uh, it says in triangle ABC, BC equals um, six. Let me draw us. Um, there's this triangle. Um, yeah. Uh, BC would be six. AC is nine. And then AB is 13. Um, there's three squares, A, B, D, E, B, C, F, G, and C, A, H, I. Um, are constructed externally on the sides of the triangle ABC. Another three squares, H, U, J, K, D, G, L, M, and F, I, N, O are constructed. Um, find the sums of the areas of H, E, J, K, D, G, L, M, and F, N, F, I, N, O. So to approach this problem, I use uh, trig. So first, because we have the three um, sides of the triangle here, we can use, um, we can find the cosine of each angle. So we would find um, the cosine of here, here, and here. So first, it would, you would... Cosine C would be uh, A squared plus B e squared uh, minus C squared divided by 2AB. So if we use these as with C alternating between uh, 6, 9, and 13, we can find the cosine. So 
for here, this cosine would be um, negative 13 over 27. This one would be um, one of, 107 over 17, and this one would be 31 over 39. Then we have a rule which states that um, the cosine of 180 minus C equals co um, negative cosine C. So basically, because these two, these things are 90 degree, um, are 90 degree angles, then, and this is 360, these two would be 180 together. So, so this is our 180, and this would be C. So the cosine, um, so basically we would flip these, uh, or and then negative. So the cosine would, th that would be 13 over 27. This would be negative 107 over 117, and this would be negative 31 over 39. And then we can, once again, use law of cosines, which would be C squared, So in this case, um, the C, C squared would be the area because as this would be C as this is cosine C. And if we plug that in, we find we can find the area of each square. And these areas would be, uh, this area would be 65. This area, uh, and then one area would be So this one would be 464 and this would be 329. And then if we add up these, uh, if we just add these up, we would get um, uh, 858, I believe. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. It, the answer is 858. And uh, I guess your process was uh, good using the law of cosines. So does anybody have any questions or comments? No? Okay. Well, we'll move on to question number five. And uh, Ian, uh, like, uh, like, I'm sorry that he took question number four, but like, uh, can you, uh, did you do question number five? No, okay, that, that's okay then. Uh, so does anybody want to explain question number five? Uh, I have like a solution, but it's not proven for anything. Like I assumed something for the problem. Okay. Is that All okay? Right. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, yeah, all right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, oops. Um, okay, so let me draw the diagram first. Where, where is my scratch one? Uh, okay. Okay.
So when I drew the diagram, it came to something like this, where this was 30, this was 30, and these two would add up to 30. Uh, and I just assumed that these would be 15. I think the problem works even if they're not exactly 50-50 split, but this just makes it really easy because then you can find this length, which is like, I don't know, 15 root 5 or something. 1, 4, 5, I think, yeah, that's right. And then the height here, which splits this into uh, 2, would make this height 30 as well. So we have four identical tri four identical triangles, each with height 30 and base 15. And that would give you 900. So I think 900 is the answer. Okay, uh, thank you for your solution. And so for this problem, uh, I actually misread it as well. So like, uh, uh, I can't be 100% sure, but I think you can still solve it for any generalized value because uh, uh, we know like the length of AB and let's just say that like BC was X and ED was like 30 minus X. Then we can figure out the areas of, uh, not the areas, the side length of the diagonals. And if we know uh, the length of all three sides of a triangle, we can figure out its area by using Heron's formula. I think oh, yeah. that's what it's called. Yeah. So I think you could probably make it work that way, but like, but uh, I'm not too sh I'm, I'm not too sh sure. Like if it's going to be easy or if it's not going to be easy or something. We actually, uh, let me just like you know. Okay, so it would be 30 and then there would be x and then there would also be a 30 and a 30 minus x. So then 30 squared plus x, uh, x squared. So yeah, okay, I have no idea. I, I misread the question, so yeah. Is the, is the answer 900? Uh, it probably is because, yeah, because like uh, since it didn't specify anything about uh, BC and ED, then uh, yeah, it would like, yeah, any generalized case would be fine. Uh, yeah, I think it would work because you could make these two mm -hmm. similar and then, I mean, these two congruent and these two congruent. And that would be a valid construction since this would yeah. be 30 and this plus this would also be 30. And so the height will come out to 30 again. So no matter how you add it up, the, the value yeah. should be 900. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's uh, move on to question number six now. So does anybody have a solution for question number six? Okay. All right, let me just clear. Okay, so question number six. ABC is an acute angled triangle. A uh, apostrophe is the center of, no, it's not apostrophe, it's A prime is the center of the square with two vertices on BC, one on AB and one on AC. Similarly, B, uh, B prime is the center of the square with two vertices on CA, one on AB and one on BC, and C apostrophe, no, I mean, C prime is the center of the square with two vertices on AB, one on BC and one on CA. Show that. Uh, a, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime on are concurrent. Okay, so uh, so first off, we are given a diagram that I guess could help us. So I'm just going to paste the, I mean, copy the diagram in. Okay, so we have A, B, C, and then we have a square inside.
And let's just say that this is the square with the center of A prime. So we have uh, the vertice A up here and the vertice B down here and the vertice C right here. And then uh, we need the dot inside of the middle. And then this would be A prime. And then, uh, okay, and then we would have, uh, okay, so now, so now we have to prove that, let's say we draw a line from A to A prime, and then let's just connect it down to the triangle. And we have to prove that A, A, A prime, B, B prime, and C, C prime are all concurrent. So uh, yeah, they're all concurrent, which means that they're all intersecting at one point. So how do we prove that they're all intersecting at one point? So there's this theorem called uh, Siva's theorem is that, uh, let's say you have a triangle. And then you have uh, lines from the vertices of the triangle to, one, uh, to the opposite side. And then these three lines will be concurrent if and only if, if and only if, let's say, uh, let me just quickly label this. This uh, the top vertice would be A, and this would be uh, B. This would be C. This would be X, Y, C. Okay, so. Uh, now this uh, this triangle is concurrent if and only if a oops a x divided by b x times b z divided by c z times c y divided by y a and this is equal to one. So that's how we'll prove that these. Uh, the points are concurrent. I mean, these lines are concurrent. So first off, let's look at the line of A, A prime first. So let's say A, A prime, this line, right? If we extend this line, it ends up at point X. It ends up at point X of this triangle, on this triangle. And now we have to figure out the ratio between BX and XC. So first off, let's figure out what Bx is. So what is Bx? And how should we express Bx? Like what values are there inside of this triangle that we can express Bx with? Well, really the only other things is like uh, the side length of the square and some uh, angles inside of this triangle, because uh, even if we have different squares, uh, we will still have this, we will still have the same angles. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's first off, uh, uh, let's first off look at this part, right? From B to the point where the square uh, starts to intersect with the triangle. So what can we represent this part as? So we can represent this part as, uh, actually I should label them. I, I should label the parts of the square. Let's call this, part uh, D, E, F, G. Okay, so we first off wanna figure out what BG is. So what is BG? So uh, uh, we see that there's, uh, we can express BG as equal to the, uh, to the side length of the square and then divided by the tangent B. So this is equal to the side length of the square. Let's just call the side length of the square uh, S divided by the tangent of angle B. Okay, so why is it the tangent of angle B? Because uh, the, tangent, uh, uh, the tangent is equal to uh, DG divided by BG. So if we divide by the tangent, then we get BG divided by DG 
uh, multiplied by s, which is also dg, which means that it will equal bg. Or, and we can also write this as s times cotangent of b. Okay, so we have bg down. That doesn't look really helpful. Uh, what about gx? How can we express gx? Um, if you have like, where ax intersects de, isn't that point to e equal to gx? Sorry, could you repeat that? So like, if you had ax intersect at de at point like, like I don't know, point t for random. Yeah. So wouldn't T E equal GX because it's like goes through the center, so it's like symmetric. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh okay, so we'll use your suggestion and uh let's say we have T right here. Oh shoot, wait, I need to redo this then. Uh okay, so I'll retype it. So we have uh first off, we have the B G is equal to the what is it? The uh, sine length S times cotangent uh, of angle B. And then we have GX is equal to TE. Okay, so then we have BX together is equal to S times cotangent B plus TE. Uh, this doesn't look too great right now because we have a lot of variables, but we'll soon be able to get rid of them. And then we have to look at CX. What is CX equal to? It's equal to CF plus FX. So, so first off, CF, it's just similar to like BG. It's equal to S times cotangent uh, angle C. And then we have uh, F, uh, yeah, we have FX. And this is equal to DT. Okay, so we we'll, uh, so now we have to uh, well, we can figure out that CX is equal to DT plus S cotangent C. Okay, uh, I'll just delete these two lines so we have more space to write with. All right, and now going on to the next line. So now we need to get BX divided by CX. And this is going to be equal to, uh, obviously, S cotangent B plus TE, where I'll, actually I should just copy paste it. All right, there we go. Okay, so this is what bx divided by cx is equal to. And after that, uh, what can we do? bx divided by cx. We see that there's a, yeah. It's, it's just dt over te, right? Because it's parallel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's dt over te. Okay, and now what can we do with this? We see that uh, there are ratios and there's both TE and DT in it. So what we can do is that we can actually add this to this and then we, we still get BX over CX because for example, let's say we had like, uh, uh, like uh, one over two, no, no, no. Okay, so what I mean is that like, for example, we have Oh, like one over two is equal to three over six is also equal to two over four, right? This is correct. So then we can, we also, uh, this implies that three plus two is over six plus four is also equal to one over two. So we can do basically the same thing with like these two equations. So then we get on the top, we have bx over cx on the left side, and this is equal to, uh, S cotangent B plus TE plus DT over S cotangent C plus uh, DT plus TE. All right, and now 
if we look on the diagram, what is dt plus te? dt plus te is just de. So then, uh, uh, so then we have. Okay, and then uh, uh, so then we have bx over cx is equal to s cotangent b, and then plus t plus d and t, which is equal to de. But you also notice that it's a length; it's a side length of the square. So we can just plus s on here, and then on the bottom there is s cotangent c, and then plus s as well. And that means we can get rid of all the s's, right? We can just divide s on uh, both of them. And then we get the result that bx over cx is cotangent b plus one over cotangent c plus one. And yet now you may think, well, th that's like still, you know, two variables, right? Like we have both a, a term with like the angle of B and the angle of C. But the neat thing is that it doesn't matter whether uh, it's like that they square with uh, A prime because we're not really using anything that is special to the square of uh, A prime or the square of B prime or et cetera. We're just using the angles of B and C which stay the same throughout the entire triangle. And it doesn't matter like what kind of lines you draw. There's still uh, the angle the angle measure of B and C will stay, stay the same. Uh, so then uh, uh, using like similar principles, we can get that uh, if we draw a line from B to uh, B prime, and let's say it ends up at Y, right? So then we would have, we will want to figure out uh, CY over AY. And then CY over AY would be cotangent C plus one because we can use a similar argument. And then the bottom would be cotangent A plus one. And with a similar, uh, yeah, exactly. And with the same argument, we can say that uh, uh, AZ, let's say that we draw a line from C to uh, C prime, and then we connect it all the way so that it intersects with AB and at a point C. So we have AZ divided by CB is going to be equal to cotangent A plus one over cotangent B, cotangent B plus one. So then if we multiply these terms together, we get that, see the cotangent B uh, and the cotangent B here all like, you know, uh, uh, it equals one. And then cotangent C plus one, this and this are equal to one. And this and this is also equal to one, which means that if we multiply them together in the end, uh, we get the statement we were trying to prove, ax over bx. Uh, oh wait, no, this isn't the exact statement, but still it's uh, very similar. So basically we get that uh, bx over cx times cy over ay times az over zb is equal to one, which means that these, uh, which means that the lines of AX, uh, BY, and CZ are concurrent. So if they're concurrent, then that means since uh, these lines are basically the extensions of the point to the uh, point in which like the square is inscribed in. So then we would uh, basically, uh, so then this basically means that uh, it's basically like proving the statement uh, that a, A prime, B, B prime, and C, C prime are concurrent. Yeah, so uh, that's all for the proof of question number six. So does anybody have any questions? No, okay. Uh, wait, I see something in the chat. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, 我, 我们就在这儿结束吗? 弄完了吗? 还没有弄完, 可是最后一个题比这个还要... 你讲完了吗? Okay. Okay, wait one second. All right, then I'll continue on to the next question. Uh, just give me a second, I need to pull up, I think it's best if I pull up a figure right here.
Okay, so. Wait, give me one second. I need to get the figure so I don't spend like 10 minutes drawing the picture. Right. Oh shoot, wait, it's, no, it's sharing this thing. Wait, I need to reshare. Okay, there we go. All right, question seven. Consider a convex quadrilateral ABCD with no two sides parallel. Let O be the intersection of its diagonals and let E uh, equal uh, uh, the intersection between the extended lines of a, B, and C, D, and F be the uh, intersection of the in, uh, extended lines of A, D, and B, C. Parallels through O to the sides C, D, D, A, A, B, B, C, intersect lines A, B, B, C, C, D, D, A, M, and P, Q, respectively. Prove that M and P, Q are collinear and that the line that contains them is parallel to E, F. Okay, so how are we going to prove that M and P and Q are going to be collinear? So first off, we, uh, it's probably easier if we just uh, prove that three of the points are collinear, and then we have to prove another three of the points are collinear. So let's take the points M, Q, and N. And I need my annotation tool. Okay, so if we need to prove that M, N, and Q are collinear, then how are we going to do that? We can use the same theorem that I talked about earlier, uh, Siva's theorem, so that we can prove that uh, M, Q, uh, Q, N, and N, M are all concurrent. But if they're concurrent, since M is outside of the triangle, then that means like uh, we can take the triangle F, A, B, right? And then we can see that uh, we can apply Siva's theorem because M is basically on AB except just extended. So uh, these three lines need to be concurrent, but if they are concurrent, then that means these three points are collinear because uh, uh, basically like if they're not concurrent, then they form a triangle. But if they are concurrent, it's like when you're pressing down a triangle until it becomes a line. Okay, so uh, to prove that they're concurrent, we have to uh, list out our formula. So our formula for this one would be that uh, BM divided by MA times AQ divided by QF times FN divided by NB is equal to one. Okay, so we have this, uh, we have the Siva's theorem for this triangle and we have to try and prove it. So first off, Let's look at uh, let's look at the terms one by one. Let's first start with f n over n b. So f n over n b. Uh, but what what other lengths is this uh, statement like? Uh, is this equal to like what is f n over n b equal to? Well, if we look around and we look for a similar triangle, we see that uh, not not a similar triangle, but like just a triangle with two parallel lines. We see that O to N is parallel to F to D, right? So then we have uh, FN divided by NB is equal to DO divided by OB. So DO over OB. Uh, and then after that, we have, uh, we have to figure out what is AQ over QF. So AQ divided by QF is equal to and then, uh, so basically we're looking for parallel lines again. And we know that like uh, the lines uh, OP, OM, OQ, and ON are all parallel to some line. So if we look at the line, uh, I think it is, uh, uh, it, it's the line, yeah, OM. No, wait, no, it's not OM. No, A, A Q. Yeah, uh, okay, so it's OQ. So if you look at the line OQ, then we see that AQ divided by QF 
is going to be equal to AO divided by OC. So AO divided by OC. And then if we're going to be looking at, we have to look at BM divided by MA, what is that equal to? So now this might be a bit more tricky because as you can see, we have BM and MA and there's an intersecting, uh, not an intersecting, uh, an overlapping part between AM and MB. So how are we going to find that? So uh, we can uh, like we can use the rest of this line, uh, ME. So like uh, you'll see later why we, we're going to use ME, but BM over ME times ME over AM. This is also equal to BM over MA. And this is equal to, yes, we can look at each individual part. So BM over ME, what is this? So BM and ME is also, uh, BM over ME is going to be equal to BO over DO. So we can see that OM is parallel to ED. So BM over ME is equal to BO over OD. So BO over OD. And then we have times the ME over AM. What is ME over AM equal to? Well, ME over AM is equal to CO over o, uh, OA. Yeah, because we can see that OM, again, is parallel to CE. And then we can see right here, the ME corresponds to the OC and the AM corresponds to the uh, a, a, AO. So we have OC divided by AO. All right, and then we can see that uh, if we multiply them all together, right, we have DO over OB times AO over OC times BO over OD times CO over AO. And, uh, the, and then all the terms cancel out so that the, uh, this statement is true. So BM over MA times AQ over QF times FN over NB is indeed equal to one. And what this means is that uh, the lines MN, NQ, and QM are co- uh, are co uh, no, they're concurrent, which means that if they're concurrent, uh, MN and Q will be collinear. So then, uh, we can, uh, so basically we now know that M, Q, and N are collinear, and we can use a similar argument because this shape is uh, like almost, like it's, a, it's symmetrical in a sense. We can prove the same thing with Q, M, and P, which means that Q and P are collinear, uh, uh, N, Q, and M are collinear, which means all four points are collinear. Okay, and then the second part is that we have to prove that the uh, line that contains them is parallel to EF. So we can prove that EF is parallel to the line if we prove that EF is parallel to the line between only two of the points. Because if we use two points, it will be a bit more simple than using four points. And we know it will still be true because all four points are collinear. Okay, so let's say we have EF, right? And we, have, we want to prove that EF is parallel to, we could take P and Q. Because we can, we see that EF and PQ are basically on like the same triangle. And on this triangle, we have to prove that PQ is parallel to EF. So then if we, uh, uh, so then that means uh, we have to prove that the triangle of DEF is similar to the triangle of DPQ. And we can prove that by doing DP divided by PE is equal to uh, DQ divided by QF. Okay, so uh, we have uh, this equation now. DP over PE is equal to DQ over QF. And then, so then let's look at the parts individually again. So DP over PE is going to be equal to uh, OD over OB because uh, if you uh, if you look right, we have uh, OP is parallel to EB, and we can see the triangle EDB. And on there, we have DP right here, PE right here, DO right here, OB right here. And then for DQ over QF, it is also equal to OD over OB. Uh, because uh, right here, we see that uh, there's a uh, DQ over QF, and we see that OQ is parallel to uh, FB. So then this is equal to OD over OB. And 
then we have proved that dp over pe is equal to dq over qf, which means that the triangles dpq and def are similar triangles. And then uh, the two lines, that means the two lines of ef and pq are parallel. And since m and n are all contained on the line of peak of uh, pq, then we can prove that uh, n, q, m, p, are uh, the line that consists in Q and P is parallel to EF. So that's all for the for question seven. So does anybody have any questions?